John Campbell video on a separate topic, also, I believe, in this last week, um, in which he, and again, he is among the most careful analysts of the COVID pandemic that I'm aware of. Um, but this one is quite shocking and also matches a different prediction uh, in a way. It's not quite as clear cut, but I, I think you'll um, I think you'll see it. Hey, Zach, can you? Yep, you're right. Uh, yeah. Part of their guidelines here. Now, this is managing breathlessness. So this was published, remember, on the 3rd of April 2020. And they say this, consider an opioid and a benzodiazepine. Now, um, what they mean there is uh, an opium-based drug like morphine and the benzo benzodiazepine they talk about is midazolam. Now, this is a classical, well-tried, trusted form of treatment that we use for uh, things like terminal agitation, part of terminal care when people are dying of conditions such as cancer and things that are incurable uh, to, to, to manage uh, a peaceful death and it, it's completely the right thing to do in the vast majority of circumstances but what seemed to happen was nice just took that and transposed that into the covid situation and covid of course we know is an infection and most people can get completely better from it what john campbell says here is that and this is a british um, memo that he is unearthing here, a Br British memo from uh, April of 2020, in which a recommendation was made for the treatment of patients who have very serious effects from uh, COVID. Uh, these are hospitalized people who are clearly in jeopardy of death. The memo suggests the application of a two drug protocol, one, an opioid, um, like morphine, and the other a benzodiazepine uh, like midazolam. And his point is, this is shocking to hear, because that combination is well understood and properly used in medicine in patients who have a terminal disease at the very end of their pathology. But this is effectively palliative care that uh, allows life to be ended by prioritizing comfort in a patient for which there is actually no medical hope. And what John Campbell says here is this doesn't make sense in the context of a COVID patient, no matter how close to death they appear, because what they are sick with is an infectious agent that they might fend off, right? The fact is we have which all- Which people do. Yeah, we have all had the experience of being very, very, very sick and then suddenly being on the mend and headed in the right direction. And what has happened is your immune system has figured out the formula sufficiently well that you go from a trajectory that if you followed it far enough would take you to death, right? And suddenly your trajectory is in the upward direction and you may not feel great, but you feel a hell of a lot better because you're on the mend. The, the uh, infection is being reduced. And his point is, look, that happens in people. So it does not ever make sense uh, to give a patient a uh, deadly, if compassionate, pair of drugs in the case that what they're sick with is an infectious agent that they actually might beat. And I will say the title of uh, his video involves the term euthanasia, which I struggled with a little bit because this is an official memo suggesting a use of this drug cocktail. This isn't the case in which somebody has said, well, this patient, you know, uh, should be uh, humanely put out of their misery. This is just medical recommendations that result in the same thing. Now, I don't know whether that's an accident or not, but I will say there's a, a segment, those who watched my last Joe Rogan uh, discussion, 1919 there's a section in there in which i become uncomfortable and i actually discuss my discomfort i say you will hear me hesitating to say this but i can't help but wonder i say something like i keep revisiting the part of the pandemic in which we are applying ventilators to desperately ill people ventilators that we later came to understand were doing more harm than good mm -hmm. they were actually killing people and my thought, the thing that I was struggling to express to Joe, was that one of the effects of 
using ventilators as the standard of care for patients who they actually harmed was that it drove up the number of people who plausibly died of COVID. And so from the point of view of justifying a draconian response to COVID, it made COVID look that much worse than it actually was. And again, I'm not saying COVID isn't a terrible disease. I think it's much more dangerous than the case fatality rate suggests. But nonetheless, driving the number of dead from COVID people up did cause all of the panic that then ensued that caused us to lock down and do ourselves damage that way, to mask children, all of the things that we did were downstream of the implication of the desperate seriousness of this disease. And we were induced to think this by many things, including fraudulent video out of China that misrepresented, uh, you know, people dying in the street, this sort of thing. Right. So anyway, this is not as secure as a autopsy result that matches a mechanistic model um, of the pathology that arises from mRNA vaccination, um, but it is another place where a prediction um, is now manifest. In other words, yes. I didn't see this drug combination thing coming, but it is perfectly consistent, right? The idea that uh, a standard of care that increases the number of people who die of COVID was not just one thing. It wasn't just ventilators. It was also... Uh, apparently, the at least in Britain, the prescription of this combination of drugs and who knows how many other things, which is also consistent with a total failure to advise people about the hazard of vitamin D deficiency, a total failure to apply the drugs that we had that actually uh, were highly effective against many uh, mRNA uh, viruses like, uh, like ivermectin. Um, so anyway, it is again part of this pattern that is very hard to um, very hard to miss once you see it. Mm. We do all sorts of things that appear to have increased harm rather than decreased harm. And you could imagine medicine is a difficult business. Sometimes you're going to do something thinking it will be helpful and it turns out to be the opposite. But when you start doing that across the board, you do everything that's unhelpful. It raises yeah. a question about why that happened. Yeah, no, and it goes... It goes on and on and on, as you say, <clears throat> you know, locking people in their homes um, away from the sun, away from the ability to do physical activity. Um, <clears throat> I recently ran into, again, a picture, I, I think maybe out of Italy somewhere of uh, the police scooping up sunbathers because <laughs> because those were the people who were at risk and putting other people at risk. Right. Being alone outside, catching the rays and uh, generating vitamin D. And um you know, we had as as obesity became clearly a comorbidity for this disease and a really strong one. And we talked about some of the really remarkable evidence for that. Uh, we had a resurgence of the idea of fat shaming as the problem. Right. It's it's and again, you know, maybe we'll get there later in this episode, but like it, it's the it's the people who are shaming others um, that is the epidemic here. It's, it's it's not the fact that actually there are going to be, uh, regardless of whether you like it or not, or think it's fair or not, um, mechanisms by which this virus is acting in your body that allows it to do more damage if you have a lot of fat on you. It's not fat shaming. It's not. Yeah. I remember uh, the sheer number of places where even just a basic understanding of COVID and how it transmits would have not only given you a different prescription, but the inverse yep. was stunning. And I remember you and I looking at each other. I, I think I remember a image that we showed probably of a newspaper article discussing how they were closing down the trails and the state parks. And, mm -hmm. and the we're, beaches. Yeah. Right. And we're just thinking, you're actually going to harm people because if they're not outside, they're going home to an environment where somebody may have COVID mm -hmm. and they're going to catch it. Yep. Whereas if they had been outside yep. at that time, they would have virtually no risk. Of the catching. playgrounds strung with caution tape for, they, for months and months and months. Children weren't allowed to play on playgrounds. I believe they literally put sand in skate parks. Oh, yes. 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 I mean, yeah, that's just ludicrous. I mean, that's, that's like almost, uh, for a little while, their skateboarding was a crime. 
wow I know. yeah how did we not see that <laughs> yeah um but you're right they made yeah. skateboarding a crime mm-hmm. um and just the sort of um anti-fun you know kids weren't threatened right. by COVID in the first place right, right? you're pouring right. sand in their damn skate park right you're, you're screwing up their world they can't go anywhere they're not going to school you're, mm-hmm. you're going to take their skate park from them with sand like yeah you're just a terrible person <laughs> that's um, right